Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And uh, Matt Skinner, our other uh, podcaster, uh, is not with us today. And this is not a um, lectionary-based podcast, but an event-based podcast. We are going to talk about preaching um, in the United States and uh, directly affected uh, communities in light uh, just post-election. So there's no text to read, um, just a situation to address. So this is we're, we're, we are recording this on Thursday, November 5th. And so post-election, the first thing to note is um, the election results are not all in. There are still at least four states uh, that have not been called. And so um, we don't know what the results are, but we know most of the results and we know uh, what the likelihood is about to be. So we're, uh, we're each gonna um, just give initial impressions. Um, so first of all, as you think about preaching, um, particularly this Sunday and next, uh, next Sunday, to me, it seems that the very first thing is to remember what your call is. That this, uh, and, and uh, if we are in a divided, uh, polarized time, although I wanna come back to that question shortly, um, that is, what is what kind of community are we? And, and we are a community that's uh, we are um, we are composed by and made up of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we're, we are not a community that defines ourselves or consists of our righteousness, our justice, our purity, our um, any adherence to the law. But it's simply this: there's one gospel that in Christ. God was reconciling himself to us, to the, the world, to himself, not counting our trespasses against us. And that that is who we are. The community is not a community uh, of political alliance. Um, any, any community, uh, any complex at all Christian community must know, and first of all, understand that it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that uh, is our unity. And that unity then means that we're going to have a great deal of diversity, including a great deal of difference in the community. So there is not another gospel, as Paul would say, there is only one gospel. Um, and there it is. And so, you know, that's my first line, as in, you know, uh, as, as it says in Ephesians, um, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. So I think that I think that's uh, helpful and important, Rolf. That we that we start with just sort of these initial reminders of what our calling is, and um, no matter what the circumstance, uh, whether it's an election, whether it's um, you know pandemic, uh, protest, uh, politics, it's. And no matter what the situation is, that that need to be regrounded in what our what our calling is and what what is it that we preach. And so I would echo uh, uh, what you said. I would add to that. Uh, it, I I come back to uh, faith active in love, uh, and that love is the you know is the cornerstone of the cornerstone of a Christian community and. Uh, and that we are, that we, uh, that we approach our um, siblings in Christ uh, from that place of love. And, uh, and, it does, and love does not erase conflict. Love does not erase difference. Uh, uh, all of those things that you said, that's anybody who's loved someone else knows <laughs> that, that that's, in, that's inherent to relationship. But to have a you know, to have that first move toward uh, toward our siblings in Christ as love, and that the Christian community, albeit diverse, uh, albeit um, in you know having conflict or whatever, uh, that that looking in there's something different, and that something different is all no matter what 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 those actually end up being that that there's something different and that something different is love that there's a kind of engagement and there's a kind of regard uh, that sees that other person as a child of God 
and that uh, sees that other person as loved by God, uh, if we're really truly believe in John 3 16. So uh, that's that that's those are my that those are my first initial uh, thoughts again like reminder of who we are. How about you Joy? What are your first impressions? Well, I appreciate uh, what both of you have said and uh, I also appreciate this opportunity for us to um, just sort of recenter ourselves uh, um, as preachers um, to uh, be reminded, as Rolf said, of, of what is our task, uh, that this perspective, this moment, um, I loved your alliteration, uh, Carolina, I hadn't even paid attention to the um, politics, pandemic, and protests, um, uh, such a preacher's voice, <laughs> but um, in, in this moment, that perspective is how our listeners are coming to, uh, to hear a word from the Lord. Um, whether um, it is out of the pain of um, a, a lost loved one, um, whether it is a sense of lost agency, um, whether it is a, a sense of lostness of, I just don't know what this moment means and what tomorrow holds. Um, and we can't get around those different perspectives that our listeners are coming from. And the reality, um, as both you have already said, is that we are in Christ, one body, and that the love of God made known in Jesus is for all. It's for all the world. Uh, I remember one of my um, uh, students uh, uh, preaching a sermon that um, had the potential of being interpreted from a particular perspective. And he was preaching, it was a elective class. He was preaching in front of his friends, uh, not just his peers, but people who knew him. And uh, when he finished, the first couple of questions, uh, sort of a question was asked and then, and then there was this rolling, yeah, 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 was, I think I know where you land, but I couldn't figure out what you were trying to support. And he took a deep sigh and he said, ah, good, because I wasn't trying to take a position. I was trying to present the promise and presence of God. And he was so afraid that he would slip into it because of the familiarity of his listeners that they would automatically take it the next step. So the fact that they were left scratching their head was uh, something that I think is good for us to think about. If your congregation, your listeners, are leaving saying, I'm not exactly sure what we were just told to do, but I'm real sure that we were reminded that we are faithful, that we are called to be a faithful people who represent the presence and promise of God. And if people are scratching their heads there, I think we've done our job not only in this moment, but in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, even after we know the results of this election. Caroline, you were going to say? No, I, I think that's I, I yeah I think that's right. And I I um you know another thing that I've been talking about uh, with with preachers and yeah my my three P's as as of late, <laughs> uh, pandemic protests and politics is, uh, is this uh, I think tension if you will, uh, theological tension uh, between. Um, that's happened with a rather unfortunate and I think simply wrong bifurcation of either you're a political, you're a, you're a prophetic preacher or you're a pastoral preacher. Uh, and of course, nobody really knows how to define prophetic, uh, but the intimation is that it's, oh, <laughs> Rolf was like, I do. Uh, but the a kind of, you know, bold speech, if you will. Uh, but we forget that the, the prophets were, they were truth tellers, but they were accompaniers of God's people you know, throughout their history. And uh, I've, I've been uh, doing some reading lately and Will Willimon in his book um, called uh, 
who lynched Willie Earl, um, preaching, uh, preaching against racism, right. said that the first prophetic move is tears. And that, uh, and that, and Abraham Heschel says that the, the prophetic voice is imbued with divine pathos. And that the kind of truth that we are speaking is not condemnation or judgment. It is naming what's being revealed under which we also stand. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's from, from the very heart of God. Um, what is being revealed in our country right now in terms of, of division or, or uh, are, in, are embedded in systemic racism and, uh, and that, but, but we, we talk about this from this, this, the very heart of God and that we're holding both of those together, that we're, that, that we're, we're doing truth telling, but with, with tears running down our face, um, because there's, we know that there can be something more, uh, or that we know that there can be something different, or that God wants something different. So um, that's another thing that I, I, when we were thinking about doing this podcast that I wanted to be able to name that I think that's a reality for, and it has been for a number of years for, for preachers that living in that tension of, but that's, that's where we live. <laughs> um, and you're not one or the other, you're both. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, uh, I actually don't agree with Willimon. I do agree with Heschel, but that is, um, if you look at the various prophets, Prophetic preaching, uh, pro prophetic preaching is not one thing. It depends on the moment. And so when second Isaiah comes along, second Isaiah comes along with great joy, you know, get thee up to a high mountain, you know, uh, because uh, the, the driving message there was hope later on in Ezekiel, it's hope and any prophetic preaching that doesn't, uh, it starts with the call of God. Uh, and that's why I think Heschel is closer to right. Uh, Heschel's way of understanding prophetic revelation was this pathos that he's a, he, he was bought. Anyway, let's not go into that. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> when Old Testament nerd for a moment, uh, let me come back. Um, the lie that the culture tells us um, is that we are defined by our um, adherence to the law, a particular kind of righteousness or a particular kind of justice or a particular kind of purity or a particular kind of people or uh, walk. And um, that's not true. Uh, we have to over and over again, remind, our, uh, remind ourselves again, as I said earlier, that we are, are, we are constituted as a people by the death and resurrection of Jesus, which then knits us together, bakes us together into one bread um, with all sorts of people whose sins are also forgiven uh, who are not like us. So that so what then? Um, well, two verse two more verses come to my mind, and uh, the first is from Romans twelve. Bless those who uh, first of all, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. I think I think that's maybe where I'd go next is. Um, as a pastor, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing right now. They're happy about the election. But mourn with those who mourn. Understand that some people are, uh, are, are upset. They don't know what it means. And live, with har live in harmony with each other. One of the things I'm actually really cheered about is I actually think that the, the lie that is being told us for, for financial reasons is that we are polarized. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but we're not actually that polarized, I don't think, as a culture, less so than I thought. So one of the news media in the city where the three of us live reported on a riot uh, in uh, downtown Minneapolis. Well, it turns out there was 15 people, you know, uh, in, in, an urban, in an urban core of two, two and a half to three million or something, 15 people. But that's what the media wanted to talk about, right? They wanted to talk about those 15 people rioting. Well, it seems that actually the country is um, of different minds. The, the election is very close, no matter which way you think about it, right? Uh, it looks like it's going to be 270 to 268. That's pretty close. Uh, 
popular vote still pretty close. The Senate uh, and House got closer, each of them. And so maybe we're actually not as polarized, and there, but there's people who make money off of telling us we are. Uh, whether, you know, so that's my uh, hope in this moment. Of course, my real hope is in God, but. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm going to put my own um, um, alliteration out there um, that it, um, folks who have heard me have heard me say this before, and that is that um, we're called to be a people who practice honesty, hospitality, and hope. Um, when I'm with my Wesleyan friends, I say holiness also, but um, uh, just for those who are out there who, who want to know if I still know how to spell that. Um, but that, that generosity of hospitality is a recognition um, that um, we have become very comfortable with, um, with the modifiers that identify our Christianity. So it's not enough for us to simply say, I'm baptized in the name of Jesus. I'm a follower of Christ. We have to identify what kind of Christian we are. And that has become more important. And that labeling, um, I, I, I agree with you, Ralph, that um, there's some type of branding that uh, the culture has um, lied us into believing. Um, but I, I can't agree with you that we're not more polarized. Uh, there are friendships that I have lost, um, not just because of politics, but more because of politics, um, but uh, friendships that I've lost simply because of the modifiers that people needed in front of my Christianity. Um, and if it didn't match theirs, uh, they needed to separate from me. They needed me to separate from them. And as I talk to others, I'm finding that to be true, no matter what your modifier is, is that we are finding that divide more real. And I think there's an honesty in being able to name that um, if we're going to be able to speak to our congregation and call us to be a welcoming table. And that is to say, there are some people among us that may be quiet about what they would say their label is, their modifier is, but are we living in this space together uh, under whatever the name of our congregation is in such a way that what we are concerned about is first and foremost that we are, as you say, Ralph, baptized in the name of Jesus, where it's a safe place to be, to have voted for the other candidate. And, and I'm saying in any congregation, if there is one person who didn't vote like the other 99% in your congregation, if that one person is othered, then you're not a welcoming Christian com congregation. And, and I, think, I think the challenge for preachers is to call each congregation to how can we be more concerned about modifying all of our identities by our Christianity rather than allowing our Christianity to be modified by anything? 